These are the notes on covalent bonds, and we've already begun to discuss them in our previous notes about electronegativity. One thing that I did not mention last time is that polarity is related to the bond strength. For the most part, in general, the greater the electronegativity difference, now you should know a little bit more about what that means, the greater the polarity and the stronger the bond. Well, that's pretty much true. That's true up to a point, up to a point. So let's look at several bonds here. Notice on this table, it's got all these bonds between hydrogen and something else. Those are actually the halogens or the halogens, a very important family on the periodic table. Fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. So let's start with the one on the bottom between hydrogen and iodine. The bond between them turns out to have electro an electronegativity difference of 0 0.5. So where does that put it? What category does that put it in? Well, look, 0 0.5 is one of those lines down on the bottom, isn't it? So you might wonder which side it falls on. If it's right on the line, it turns out it goes with the one above it. It goes to the one to the right. So that makes it what? A polar covalent bond. Very slightly polar. It turns out you can be slightly polar, you can be moderately polar, and you can be extremely polar. Okay? So that bond right there with a 0 0.5 electronegativity difference, remember it's the difference that matters, has an energy of 298 kilojoules per mole. Now that unit, it might be unfamiliar to you, it probably is, but since they're all in the same unit, we can just compare the numbers. Let's not get into what that unit really boils down to yet. Okay, and let's jump to the one on the top now, between hydrogen and fluorine. Now, fluorine, of course, has the gold medal for the highest electronegativity in the whole universe. So fluorine is probably gonna have a bigger difference between it and lowly hydrogen, which is really just barely into the electronegativities of the nonmetals. It's one of the lowest for nonmetals. So the electronegativity difference is gonna be much greater. It turns out it's 1.8. Well, that's a lot. Where does that fall on the bar below? Right there, way over to the right much closer to the upper limit of polar covalent. So that is what I would call a very polar bond, an extremely polar bond. Well, what about its bond energy? Well, now instead of being on the bottom, we saw 298, that was almost 300. This one is 570. Well, that's pushing 600, not quite, but it's getting there. So that is actually almost twice the energy. So let's think about these bonds. If you wanted, to break these bonds. That is how much energy it would take to break the bonds. So it would take twice as much energy to break the HF bond as it would to break the HI bond, almost, nearly as much, twice as much, okay? So that means that bond is much, much stronger. The HF bond is much stronger. And guess what else it means in terms of the length? Do you think that bond would be longer or shorter? Remember, if it's a stronger bond, it is a, Shorter bond, shorter bonds are stronger because it pulls the nuclei closer together. So that means the HF bond would definitely be a shorter bond than the HI bond, okay? Which is one reason that it takes more energy to break it. Also bond energy is the energy that came out when that bond formed. Technically that's the way they measure it. That's the way they, that's what it really means. But it's the same amount it would take to break it. That's true. It takes the same amount to go back in as what came out before. And I think it's just easier to think about how much would it take to break that bond. It's just the way we look at things. So I think it's easier to think about bond energies that way. Now, I want to explain to you something interesting that happens as we go from electronegativity differences, look on the bottom, from zero all the way to 3.3. I might have failed to mention earlier that 3.3 is the largest electronegativity difference that you could possibly have because of the way they were defined by Linus Pauling. The highest one is defined as four. The lowest one is 0 0.7. Four minus 0 0.7, the biggest difference you could possibly have is 3.3. So that bar does not keep going, that's it. Those are all the ranges you can have, anything from zero, and you can have zero, all the way to 3.3, and you can have 3.3, and everything in between. So the interesting thing that I did not mention is that 
Covalent bonds are actually pretty strong. Let's say nonpolar covalent bonds are moderately strong. Let's start there. Now, I did not put numbers on this bond strength diagram. This is like a graph I'm going to make because it depends on many other factors. It depends on which elements you have. There's more to it. But I can sort of give you a rule of thumb, like the way that they, the pattern they generally follow. So I am deliberately leaving out numbers on my y-axis, which is funny because that's something I tell you never to do. But here I am doing it. Oh, well. So if we go from 0 to 0 0.5, watch what happens with the bond strength. It's pretty much a flat line. There's essentially no difference between the bond strength when your electronegativity difference is 0 or 0 0.1 or 0 0.2 or 0 0.3 or 0 0.4. They're all the same. All the way until you just reach 0 0.49, just before the 0.5 cutoff. Those are nonpolar covalent bonds. But as soon as you pass that point, 0 0.5, this is what happens next. The bond strength begins to increase. So what I mean by that is it pulls them closer together. It would be harder to break that bond. It would take more energy to break it. Kind of like we just saw in the previous example. Kind of like the 0 0.5 was around 300 and the 1.8 was almost up to 600. That's sort of what we're seeing right there. That would be further over to the right. So that is a very, very dramatic rise. So that means a very, very polar bond. Like when the difference is like 2.0, that would be a really difficult bond to break. It would take a huge amount of energy. But what happens after that? This is the interesting part. Right at the 2.1 line, watch what happens. The bond strength drops off a cliff and then it begins to rise again. So why does this happen? This happens because now we're generating ions. When the difference in electronegativity is so much that one atom can steal an electron from its neighbor, you no longer get a really close tight bond. You get two separated ions and then they're sort of sticking together on their outsides, on the outside of the ion. Think of it that way. So that winds up separating them by a lot more, much more than any covalent bond is separated, making a much weaker bond. So that is why ionic bonds, notice, are always weaker than covalent bonds. However, this gets more complicated. If you do some research and if you look this up, what you might find is in a lot of places, they're going to be telling you that ionic bonds are stronger. So why is that? Well, it's complicated because Covalent bonds just go in one direction and that's it. But if you think about ionic bonds, it's not just one ionic bond like between sodium and chloride. Well, that chloride is going to be attached to another sodium on the other side and another sodium above and below and on all six sides, really. So what if we were to multiply that bond times six? Well, that makes a huge difference. So let me erase that. Now I'm going to show you that line again, but also above it, watch, I'm going to show you what would happen if we were to multiply that bond by six, because that's really what we're getting in an ionic compound. We're not getting just one ionic bond for each ion. We're generally getting six as long as you're in the interior of the crystal and you're not on the very surface of the crystal or a corner of the crystal. That's the only time this would not be true, by the way. So watch what happens. Okay, look at the one that's times six. That is skyrocketing and it keeps going up. It actually curves upward. And very quickly, it gets stronger than any covalent bond ever. That is why ionic compounds, ionic compounds are such hard materials because they're bonded in six directions. Now, of course, those six bonds, that only goes when the ions are the same but opposite charges, like positive one, negative one, positive two, negative two, positive three, negative three. It's not actually always six and it depends on the ratio of the charges. But we're just thinking about sodium chloride here and a typical ionic compound, and it's true for a lot of them. So that is why ionic compounds are so hard. They're so resistant to bending, and they're kind of hard to break. Eventually, you can break them, and when you break them, they shatter, yes, but that's why ionic compounds have this reputation. It's because you don't just get one ionic bond, you get six around each ion, okay? So notice that even where that starts off, it's pushing the upper limit of the strength of the polar bonds. So even a very slightly ionic compound, like a 2.2, is going to be rivaling overall with the six bonds in every direction, 
it's going to be rivaling the strength of even the strongest polar bonds. So how is water able to dissolve ionic compounds? Well, here's the trick. Water never bothers attacking all six at once. It wouldn't be able to handle that, actually. But water never has to. Because think about a salt crystal. A salt cr crystal is a big block. Think of it as a big cube. Water attacks on these surfaces. And the surfaces never have six. The most they can have is five and sometimes only four. And if you're at a corner, the corner of the cube, well, it's probably going to only be connected to three opposite ions. So notice that that drops it down much, much lower. Then it would be halfway in between those lines. And then water, yes, could rip them apart. So what water does is very ingeniously, it attacks an ionic compound from the corners and from the surfaces, and then it works its way in. That's why stirring up uh, salt makes it dissolve so much faster because you're breaking it into smaller chunks. There's more corners, more surfaces for the water to attack. So that's the thing about ionic bonds that can often be misleading. If you look it up in, under many sources, what you're gonna see is they're gonna be telling you that ionic bonds are stronger, but that is not true. That is not at all true individually. But collectively, yes, they make a very strong material, okay? The last thing I wanna point out is I'm gonna add another y-axis on the right side. Watch this, the bond length. Because remember, the bond length is very different than the bond strength. In fact, they're kind of like opposites. That's an inverse relationship. So when the bond is strong, that's a shorter bond. When the bond is weak, that's a longer bond. And I've indicated that, look on the right side and compare it to the left side. So that's a little bit counterintuitive because of the way we normally think. Okay, because longer sounds like more, so you'd imagine, but then think about what it really means. It really means that the two nuclei of the atoms or ions have a greater separation. So think about two nuclei really far apart. Wouldn't it be easy to knock one away from the other? What about two that are pulled really, really close together, really, really holding on tight to each other? Well, those are obviously going to be hard to break apart. So if you think about it, it kind of makes sense that a shorter bond is a stronger bond. So notice on the left side at the top, it says strong. And on the right side at the top, it says shorter. And again, I'm not using numbers because it depends on the size of the atoms. It depends on the individual atoms we're using and the ions that are in these bonds. And on the bottom on the left side, it says weak. And on the bottom on the right side, it says longer. So again, strong bonds are short, weak bonds are long or vice versa. You could say it, long bonds are weak, short bonds are strong. It's the opposite of what you might guess. Another way of thinking about the bond strengths is thinking about the bond length and how it is affected by the increasing polarity. So obviously, if we have a nonpolar covalent bond, notice the red arrow pointing in the green, what we're getting is electrons, a pair of electrons, or sometimes more than one pair, are being shared equally. It's almost like the atoms don't even notice that there is any difference at all as long as it's less than 0 0.5. They don't take advantage of it. They share perfectly equally. So if it's 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, they share equally. All the way up to 0 0.49, they seem to share equally. But suddenly, when the electronegativity difference reaches that critical 0 0.5 mark, that changes. Now what you get is a polar covalent bond. Now here, it's a little bit polar. And what we're seeing is a delta negative developing on the right side. See that little symbol on the right side? That's the Greek letter delta, lowercase delta and a negative after it. Well, on the left side, I see the same thing, delta, but with a positive, delta positive. So what does that mean? That means we're developing a charge on the side. Why is there a charge there? Because the electrons are not being shared equally anymore. They're being shared unevenly, meaning that the more electronegative element, which is the purple one in this case, is hogging those electrons. It's not sharing equally, it's sharing but it's keeping them more than 50% of the time. Maybe it's keeping them 60, 70% of the time now, okay? Well, that's not fair. So what happens is if the electrons spend more time 
on the right side of this molecule, that right side of the molecule has more of the negative charge. But it's not necessarily a full negative one or negative two charge. It's sort of in between zero and one or between one and two. So we use the delta sign to show that it's not exactly a negative one charge. If we just put a negative there, it indicates a negative one charge in chemistry. That's why we use that. And whatever that delta negative charge, well, you must have the exact same but opposite delta positive on the opposite side. Because if it's hugging the electrons on one side, well, then it's pulling them away from the other side. And you could sort of think of it as almost partially exposing the nucleus on the other side. That's where that positive is coming from. So whenever you have a delta negative, you have a delta positive on the other side. And this is a polar covalent bond. This is caused by the unequal sharing of electrons, but they're still shared. They are still considered atoms, both of them. They just have a little bit of a negative and positive end to the molecule. This affects the way the molecules behave. What about if it got even more polar? Watch what happens. If we go further into the middle of the polar covalent category, like 1.3, something like that, and they're the middle, well, now the delta negative has increased, and the delta positive has too. Notice that I'm showing this by the exaggerated size of the of the um, purple member of the compound and a shrinken, uh, shrunken size of the aqua colored member of the compound. So now they're being pulled actually tighter together. The bond length has shrunk. It continues to shrink as this happens. There's, the nuclei are squeezed closer and closer together, developing a stronger and stronger, shorter and shorter bond. And they have a greater negative and positive charge on the end, delta negative, delta positive. Well, let's keep going. What about the next one? What if we go right near the very edge where we have a really, really polar bond? Well, you can see it's the same effect, even more so. Now we've got an even greater delta negative and even greater delta positive. The more electronegative element is now hogging the electrons, who knows, maybe 90% of the time. So that produces a huge delta negative charge on one end. And it leaves behind a delta positive on the opposite end. It shrinks the bond length because it has shrunk one of the members of the compound. Even though the other one has grown, overall the distance between the nuclei is even smaller. So that's a stronger, shorter bond. But then once you pass that critical difference of 2.1, remember, then an electron can be completely stolen, completely. And what you get is ions. You get a cation and an anion. And because they're separate ions, they're no longer sort of overlapping, tugging on each other's electrons so much. They just sort of have an overall charge and they're sticking together sort of on the outside. So notice that the bond length here has increased to an even greater length than it was to start with, with the nonpolar covalent bond. So these would be the greatest bond lengths and therefore the weakest bonds. So this is another way of understanding the strength of bonds because due to polarity. Now back to the octet rule. Remember again, everybody's gotta get one. You gotta get it. Like a Pokemon, is that how it goes Ian? Gotta get one, gotta catch them all, whatever. The octet rule is basically that elements would not only like to have eight valence electrons, they are desperate. They've got to get eight valence electrons. And we've seen how this happens with two fluorine. Fluorine, each one of them needs one. We've been through this. So each one tries to grab the other one's unpaired electron and winds up making a covalent bond. Remember, a covalent bond is shown with a dash. Even though in our textbook they show it both ways, I do not want to see you showing it with just the electrons. That is not at all clear. I always want to see the dash form that shows that you understand there's a bond there. Putting two dots there doesn't show me that you know there's a bond there. So even though our textbook, unfortunately, has decided to show what we call the old, what I like to call the old fashioned way and the new way, I only want to see the newer way, which is showing the bonds very clearly. I will not mark it correct if you just put those two dots there. So each of those dots, those 
Lewis dots, which represent valence electrons, they went into that covalent bond. So remember, that dash represents a pair of electrons. One pair, which is two electrons. Ah. And of course, they're dreaming they're neon. You're never going to be neon, guys. You're fluorine. You're out of luck. So the way we show a covalent bond, for example, here, this is that extremely polar bond. Actually, this isn't the one we calculated, but this one is also an extremely polar bond between hydrogen and chlorine when they form hydrogen chloride, which we actually never really call that. We call it hydrochloric acid, but HCl. When it forms HCl, notice that that one unpaired electron from hydrogen goes into the bond. The only unpaired electron from chlorine goes into that bond. And so hydrogen has two, that's all it wants. It's like helium now, it thinks it is. And chlorine has an octet, okay? Because it has those six from those three pairs. And then it's got the two in the bond. They count on both sides. So remember, to be stable, all of these elements have to get a noble gas electron configuration. And they sort of have to pretend they're noble gases. Pretend they have an octet. Or in the case of hydrogen, it's a duet. It's really just what helium has. But what I did not mention is we refer to this as a single covalent bond. You can probably guess why we would call it a single covalent bond. What could I possibly be contrasting it against? Multiple bonds. So multiple bonds are when the same two atoms share more than one pair of electrons. This happens quite a lot in chemistry. And that is not an equal sign between those two carbon. That is a double bond. That is not a by definition sign, which is like the three bars of mathematics. That is a triple bond. So double bonds and triple bonds, well, that looks pretty strong. Two of those, that's gotta be stronger, right? And in this case, your intuition is right. Two bonds are of course stronger than one. Three bonds are of course stronger than one or two. So just like they look, they really are stronger. So let's think about this, stronger bonds. Would they be shorter or longer then? You should be able to tell me. If it's a stronger bond, it is a shorter bond. So double bonds are shorter than single bonds and triple bonds are shorter than double bonds because they're stronger, they're harder to break, they take more energy to break, they gave off more energy when they formed as well, and it depends, the exact length of them, well, that depends on the atoms involved. That depends on which atoms you're talking about. Here we're showing them between the carbon. Notice the other bonds between the carbon and the hydrogen, those remain single bonds. Those are just regular old single covalent bonds. And can you see that the carbon has an octet? It's a little hard to see now, but remember, every one of those covalent bonds, the dashes, represents two electrons, a pair of electrons. So if you have four pairs, right, isn't that eight? Four pairs is eight. So every one of those carbons, notice, is contacting four of those covalent bonds, okay, if you count them up. So yes, they have octets. And each hydrogen, of course, only wants two, and they've got it as well. So sometimes making a single covalent bond is not enough to satisfy the octet. Take a look at these two oxygen. These two oxygen can easily make a bond. You can see that just like fluorine did, right? They've each got an unpaired electron. I've situated it sort of pointing toward, they're pointing toward each other. So you can see which one they would grab, that's obvious. But what about the other one on the bottom? Well, that one could make a bond too, but where would that go? Well, it turns out bonds always go directly between the nuclei of the atoms. We don't have them zigging off in one direction. We don't have them circling around. They're always just straight lines, boom, boom, between the two nuclei. So when we want to show the bonds that oxygen makes in order to satisfy its octet, we always show them directly between the nuclei. So once oxygen forms that first bond, well, it's going to be looking to make another bond. It's going to want to make another bond. But that other oxygen is also looking to make another bond. <clears throat> so they can take care of each other's problem right there. They can just make an additional bond. So watch what happens. We wind up with what looks like an equal sign, 
but that is actually a double covalent bond. Remember, each one of those dashes represents a pair of electrons. So now they are sharing two pairs of electrons and it counts on each side. So now they think they also think they're neon, but they're increasingly delusional because remember, only six valence electrons went in from each side. That is only 12 total valence electrons, 12 valence electrons. To have two octets, wouldn't you actually need 16? So we're getting increasingly irrational here. We're getting further and further away from a real octet, but the oxygen acts as if it's in an octet. It acts incredibly more stable. I'm not saying oxygen is stable. I mean, that's what makes things rust and burn. So I'm not saying that's stable, but compared to an oxygen atom, which is ridiculously unstable, so unstable that we never see it in nature, never ever find it on its own, okay, this is much more stable. So by having an octet, a noble gas electron configuration, they become ridiculously more stable. The potential energy drops dramatically. But the only problem is the catch is they're stuck together. So that's why we always find oxygen in this form. Whenever we find pure oxygen, it's always in the form of O2. Guess what? That's what you're breathing. That's what you're respiring with right now. You are inhaling as part of the air around you, about 21% only, less than a quarter of the air you're breathing, but enough is oxygen, which we need to live, of course, to respire. So that explains why we can breathe oxygen out of the air. We can incorporate it into our bloodstream, sort of capture it. It's complicated. You must have learned about that in bio, about respiration, and because it has a double bond. Now, I like to think of one of these little, what we call diatomic molecules, like O2. That's oxygen right there, O2. I like to think of it as being shaped kind of like a peanut. Okay, kind of like, can you imagine that? Look, a peanut, right? But this is a peanut that we can crack open and we can use the oxygen in our system. But what if that peanut wasn't boiled, like some peanuts, you know, or roasted so that they are easy to open up? What if it's a peanut, like fresh off the vine? Have you ever seen one of those? Really hard to get them to open, good luck. Well, we see that as well. Because sometimes in order to satisfy an octet, you need what is called a triple bond. So there we see oxygen on the top. That is the Lewis structure. We call these Lewis structures, by the way. When we show the Lewis dots for each atom and the bonds between them, the covalent bonds between them. So how do they satisfy their octets? You can see that in the Lewis structure. On the bottom, we see one for nitrogen. That's N2, the nitrogen molecule. Notice that for nitrogen to satisfy its octet, it actually has to make a triple bond. And just like you'd imagine, yes, triple bonds are stronger. So nitrogen is also shaped like a peanut, N2. But this peanut has a triple bond. So that means it's a lot harder to crack that peanut. So that's another peanut, but this is one that we cannot get out of the air. We try to breathe in nitrogen. We do actually. It goes right in our lungs. We've, it's all around us, easy to access, but we are never able to use any of the nitrogen that ever goes in and out of our lungs. It all goes back out. So because of that triple bond is just a little bit stronger, a little bit shorter, a little bit harder for us to break, we are unable to get the nitrogen we need. And by the way, we do need nitrogen not as much as we need oxygen. We're far more dependent on a regular supply of oxygen, but we still need nitrogen to grow and we can't get it out of the air. We just can't manage to crack that peanut open. It's in there, we just can't get at it. And that's kind of like the difference between a double bond and a triple bond. This also explains why nitrogen is always trying to get back to this molecule, to this nitrogen gas, because it is so stable. So if nitrogen is found in anything else, like in nitrate, it's almost like it's spring loaded to pop out of that and turn into the gas because the gas has a wonderful triple bond. So that's one reason why nitrogen is found in so many explosives. It's because of that triple bond we find in nitrogen gas. So remember that 
stronger bonds are shorter, right? So this shows you the bond length between two carbon atoms. It shows you the bond length of a single bond, a double bond, and a triple bond. Now these are measured in the unit of angstroms. That's an A with a little circle above it. An angstrom is a 10 billionth of a meter. It's very, very small. It's a tenth of a nanometer, or you can think of it as 100 picometers, which is another way that we measure bond lengths is in picometers. So pretty much on this scale, the units you're going to either see are picometers, so that would be like 154 picometers, or angstroms. Those are the way that we measure bond lengths. So you're going to see one or the other, but these are all in angstroms. So notice that the single bond is 1.54 angstroms. Let's say that's... 100% of the single bond length. The double bond is 1.34 angstroms, shorter because it's stronger, right? That's 87% as long. And then the triple bond is even shorter still. It is 78% as long, 1.20 angstroms. So they really do pull the nuclei closer together, having those multiple bonds, making them shorter bonds and of course stronger bonds harder to break so just exactly like it looks on this picture it would be much harder to break apart those two carbon on the bottom than the two on the top much much harder to break apart the triple bond and of course they gave off more energy when they formed when that bond formed another good example of multiple bonds is carbon dioxide one reason we have so much trouble getting rid of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere is because of double bonds. Carbon dioxide actually has two pairs of double bonds, so breaking it apart in any way is a big pain, let's just say. It's going to take some doing, okay? So carbon dioxide is one of the things that we produce. You're producing it right as you're watching these notes. You are actually producing carbon dioxide. You're taking oxygen in the air and what you're ex exhaling is carbon dioxide once that carbon dioxide is released in the atmosphere it takes a lot of work to change it into something else it's going to stay like that for an awfully long time you know plants can do it you know they use solar energy to turn it into a sugar but uh photosynthesis of course but there's only so many plants in the world okay there's only so much surface area of the earth places for plants to live Places plants can survive. And so carbon dioxide, of course, is increasing in the Earth's atmosphere. And you could say one of the reasons is because of its double bonds. Now, I guess there are occasionally peanuts that have three segments. Um, I guess I could have found one. But so I guess you could say this looks like a weird kind of peanut or maybe an edamame or something. But uh, I'll have to work on that metaphor. Okay, I had to do it. I went and found a picture that I had of a pea pod with three segments. So I guess this will be my metaphor now from now on for carbon dioxide. So Lewis structures are great until suddenly they're not. Sometimes you run into a molecule that Lewis structures don't really work for and we have to resort to something we call resonance structures. This is a resonance structure for ozone, which is O3. It's a molecule with three oxygen atoms stuck together. This is different than regular oxygen, which is O2, which is what you breathe, what you want to breathe. Ozone, you don't want to breathe. It's toxic. The only place we do want it is up in the stratosphere where there is an ozone layer you may have heard of that protects us from ultraviolet radiation. So it's really good that it's up there. We just don't want to breathe it down here. Well, the problem with ozone is it is possible to make a Lewis structure for it, like this one. You may not have realized that you can actually shuffle around the valence electrons around, around the members of a molecule, the different atoms in a molecule, but you can. So this actually works. If you look at each one of these, they actually have an octet. Like, for example, the one on the left has a pair above and below. That's four and it's got two bonds connected. Each one of those is a pair, that's four more, that's eight. The one in the middle has three bonds connected to it, that's six, and then it's got the two on the top, that's eight. The one on the right has three pairs, and then one bond connected, which also adds up to eight. So they actually have octets. 
But here's the problem with that. That oxygen in the middle, the central oxygen atom, is preferring the oxygen on the left. It's double bonding to it. It must really like that oxygen atom, as opposed to the one on the right, which I guess it doesn't like as much. But that oxygen atom doesn't have a brain. It has no way of preferring one oxygen over another. Oxygen atoms are identical. So in fact, this is sort of impossible. How can it prefer one over the other? So we also have to draw it this way, which is the opposite way. Notice it's like a reflection. And notice that both of those are illustrated above with the back and forth arrow in between. So what we're saying there is that it's resonating going back and forth between one structure and another and back to that and so on. So resonance structures are necessary when drawing one Lewis structure isn't enough, doesn't tell the whole story or doesn't make sense. So resonance structures, what does it really mean? Well, probably what it really means is that the bond is sort of in between a, um, a single covalent bond and a double, kind of like a one and a half bond and that the valence electrons are sort of going around the whole molecule. That's sort of a little bit closer to reality, but this is the way that we draw them. And we're gonna only see a very few examples of this. This is one example that we're, you're gonna be aware of. And then we'll see another example later in organic chemistry. So just be aware that Lewis structures are pretty good, but they sort of fail us in some circumstances. And then we have to resort to things like this, resonance structures. By the way, for some molecules, you need more than just two resonance structures. Sometimes you need three, sometimes you need more than that. So this is a very simple one where you just resonate between one structure and another. And back. So to be a member of the molecule club, to be in that exclusive club, you need to only have covalent bonds. But it doesn't matter if they're polar or nonpolar, any kind of covalent bond is welcome, all right? They just can't be ionic bonds. Ionic bonds rule you out of the molecule club, okay? So let's look through a list of items and see if they are molecules or not molecules based on this definition. They can't be ions. They can't have any charges, okay? They're probably gonna be mostly nonmetals. That's the rule of thumb. They're, they are composed of atoms. Let's see if we can go through a list and determine if they're molecules or not. Do they get to join the club or not? Remember, a covalent bond is when you share electrons. You can share one pair of electrons. You can share two pairs of electrons. You can share three pairs of electrons. But it turns out that you can't really share four pairs because of the geometry of the atom. And we'll talk about that in the next notes. But because of the geometry of the atom, it's pretty much, I'll say pretty much impossible to share four pairs. So for the purposes of what we're talking about, let's just say there are no quadruple bond. We don't see that. So we see single, double, and triple covalent bonds, sharing one pair, two pairs, or three pairs. But all of them are covalent bonds, and all of them are acceptable when you're making molecules. So notice these molecules, are mo a lot of molecules are itty bitty little guys. They only go so far but sometimes it's possible to build a much larger one. We'll see that later. But these are a lot of the most common molecules are just very tiny little, some of them look like peanuts, some of them I guess look like edamame, and some of them, you know, look like Mickey Mouse heads. So to save time, what we're gonna do this time, instead of doing the actual calculations of the electronegativity differences, we're gonna just use the rules of thumb. The rules of thumb are pretty good. Let's see how well they work. That a covalent bond forms between two non-metals and an ionic bond forms between a non-metal and a metal. Let's see if those work. And remember, of course, the third one is that if you only have metals, then it's definitely metallic. Here we go. So here's the list. H2, NaCl, H2O, NH4, NO3, CH4, and KF. Let's go through and decide if they are molecules. So last time we actually subtracted and found the exact electronegativity difference. This time we're just going to use the rules of thumb. So let's plop those guys on there. There they are. Hydrogen, H2. Well, look for hydrogen on there. Oh, there it is. Where is it? Up at the top on the left. See it? 
oh, it's green. What does that mean on this periodic table? Those would be nonmetals. So hydrogen is a nonmetal. H2, they're both nonmetals. What's the rule of thumb? Is that a covalent bond? Yes. So that is a molecule. And of course, because both hydrogen have the same electronegativity, of course, it's going to be nonpolar. But that doesn't matter for molecules. So we're not going to worry about whether it's polar or nonpolar for this one. NaCl, is that two nonmetals? Look at where the Na is, sodium on the left. That was one of the demos we did in our lab, in one of our labs. That is a metal. Okay, so we've got a metal and then chlorine. Oh, look on the right. Okay, that's a green one. That's a nonmetal. So a metal and a nonmetal, what's that rule of thumb? Ionic bond. And of course, sodium chloride is salt. That's your table salt. So of course, that's an ionic compound. That is your poster child for ionic compounds right there. What about H2O? Well, look at hydrogen. There's two of them, but just look at hydrogen. And look at oxygen way over on the right near the top. Oh, yeah, they're both nonmetals. So the rule of thumb is covalent bond, and that could be, yes, a molecule. Then we get to the next one. This is the hardest one, NH4NO3. So look, nitrogen, that's up on the right. Okay, that's green. Hydrogen up on the left, that's green. And then there's another nitrogen, and then oxygen is up on the right, that's also green. So they're all nonmetals. So you'd think, huh, if they're all nonmetals, we should probably have the rule of thumb is covalent bonds. And in a way that's true, inside of these guys, you do have covalent bonds. But notice how the nitrogen is listed twice there, right? That's because each one of those is a discrete entity. Each one of those is an ion. And between them, we have an ionic bond. So this is the ammonium nitrate, the same one that we used in the cold pack lab, NH4NO3. It can be a fertilizer, it can be an explosive, because those nitrogen wanna get out of there, get back into that peanut in the air, triple bonded peanut. Um, so that is, that's the tricky one, that is not a molecule. They get ruled out of the club just because they have pesky little charges, because one of them is a cation and one of them is an anion. The NH4 is the cation, it's plus one and the NO3 is the anion, it's minus one, but when you put them together, their charges are neutralized, so it's not shown there. So NH4, NO3 is not a molecule. Interesting, right? Then we have CH4. Well, look at carbon, it's up on the right, it's green. Look at, we already saw hydrogen, that's green. They're, all, they're both green. So covalent bond and molecule. What about KF? Are those both nonmetals? Are they both green? Where's K? K is not on the right, it's actually on the left. It's actually just below sodium. There's K, so that's a metal. And fluorine, of course, we've seen that. That's the most electronegative one, way up at the right, upper right. That's a nonmetal. Metal, nonmetal, what's the rule of thumb when there's a big difference of electronegativity? What's the rule of thumb? Ionic bond, okay? And remember, the family that fluorine is in, fluorine is sort of the captain of its family, the head of its family, those are the halogens, the salt makers. So if you see fluorine or chlorine or bromine, you're probably gonna be talking about a salt, but not always, because you can also have chlorine gas. And if you do have chlorine gas, Cl2, you wanna run away from it. It's a green gas. Green gases are rarely a good thing. So let's go through the rundown. Was hydrogen a molecule? Molecule. Yes. Was sodium chloride a molecule? Was water a molecule? Molecule. Yes. Was ammonium nitrate a molecule? Silence. Was, no, it was not. Was methane, I forgot to mention the name of that, CH4 is methane, by the way. Is that a molecule? Molecule. Yes. And then KF, that's potassium fluoride. Is that a molecule? No. It is not a molecule because it is a metal and a nonmetal. So now you can sort of see that's pretty accurate, the rules of thumb. The only one you might have tripped up on using the rules of thumb is that ammonium nitrate. That's a tricky one. Tricky one doesn't look like the others, more complicated. But otherwise it works, so it works, you know, a lot of the time. So sometimes we don't have to use all the exact electronegativity differences. Sometimes we can just get by with the rules of thumb. They're pretty good. 
So that is the end of the notes on covalent bonds, but it is far from the end of what we need to learn about covalent bonds. There's a lot of geometries and structures we're going to get into next time. Thank you. Bye.